Welcome to Douglas Wilson's The Plodcast, presented by Canon Press. Welcome to Plodcast. This is episode 203, 203. Those of you who have been with me from the beginning, thanks for sticking around. Those of you who have just joined us, you are most welcome. So one of the things that's happening as I'm recording this, one of the things that's happening is we are witnessing the debacle of the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan. We are, we're, we are seeing translators who are likely to be executed. We are seeing missionaries and pastors who are uh, facing likely martyrdom. We are seeing, uh, you know, Christian congregations that are going to go through it. The fall of Kabul to the Taliban. There are the heart-wrenching and horrendous uh, photos of people clinging to the outside of airplanes that are taking off, trying to get out. It's just an awful, horrific mess. Now, there's a, an important qualification to put up front. I am not a fan at all of the U.S. going around the world trying to, kind, trying to conduct exercises in nation building. I don't think, I, I don't have a, I didn't have a problem with us going into Afghanistan to deal with the uh, terrorist nests that were there. And, uh, but once we have taken care of them, we ought to leave. And if they do it again, we ought to go in again and take care of them. Uh, but we ought not to say, hey, while we're here, let's build a Jeffersonian democracy. Because whatever it is you're going to get, it won't be Jeffersonian democracy. So I, I don't believe we should have gone in. I don't believe that we should have, uh, well, I, I don't believe we should have gone in and stayed in. I don't think we should have tried to build a, a nation in the Middle East that was um, created in our image. We simply should have said, look, if you harbor terrorists, we're going to come in after them, and that, that's all there is to it. And that's all, that would have been relatively simple. But when we stay in order to build a nation, and you have people who, uh, we, and we, we were there for 20 years, right? Uh, when that happens, you have people whose, whose vocation, they cooperate with us, they are translators. If you just one day up and leave, uh, you, you ought to remember uh, the Colin Powell Pottery Barn rule, which is if you break it, it's yours. So Afghanistan wasn't our problem before we went in. But if we go in there, and if we're there for 20 years, and if a father can go and serve in Afghanistan at the beginning of the war, and at the end of the war, his son that was born in the first year of the war can go there also and also fight in the same war, that's an extended period of time. That's a long time. And if we're there that length of time, we have all kinds of commitments, all kinds of spoken and all kinds of unspoken commitments. And this uh, inept clown show of, a, of, a, of removing ourselves from Afghanistan is just horrific. Now, I'm fully supportive of us getting out of Afghanistan. I just think that if you've been there for 20 years, you have a responsibility to extricate yourself slowly and carefully. You can't just say goodbye. You can't just say, let's, uh, let's be done now. Uh, if you do something like that, the, uh, the people like the Taliban, they can smell fear. They can smell panic. They can see what's going on, and they can um, do what they have, in fact, done, which is um, sense weakness and exploit it. So, as we are, and, and it's absolutely too late now to do anything about it. Perhaps, you know, perhaps they can do a get some additional planes to evacuate more people. Maybe, maybe something can be done. But the basic awfulness of the situation is um, you can't unring the bell, you can't unscramble the egg. Our withdrawal from Afghanistan was a total. Uh, dishonorable uh, disgrace. And of course, we should, as Christians, we should pray for the Christians there. We should pray for the people who um, made the bad mistake of believing American promises and, um, and, and take it as a 
a spur to get us to pray for pray for true repentance to be poured out on our nation because we are in bad shape as evidenced by this so this is episode 203 of the podcast and we're continuing our study of homartiology and so we've come to the hapax verb delao delao d e l a o delao so in second corinthians 42 it says but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully. There's our verb there, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. So, this verb represents the way that Paul did not handle the scriptures. There are two ways to do this, and although, although one is worse than the other, they're both of them not any good. So, Paul says that he did not handle the Word of God deceitfully. He didn't do that. Well, here, the first way of handling the Word of God deceitfully is when people twist Scripture to make it say what it is not saying. The Apostle Peter refers to this kind of thing when he points to the people who twist the Scriptures to suit themselves. That's in 2 Peter 3.16. The verb that Peter uses there is strablao which means to put the passage on the rack and turn the crank. So you're, you're basically torturing, you're torturing the text. A man handles the word deceitfully when he uses the truth of God as a way to tell lies. This is what the, prom, uh, the promulgator of heresy does. He sets up the text of Scripture and arranges it in a way that makes it into a falsehood. The devil quotes Scripture in the temptation of our Lord. But you can, you can take snippets of Scripture out of context, arrange them in a certain way, and make them say something that they're not really saying. And a popular example is Judas went and hanged himself. Go thou and do likewise, and what you do, do quickly. So that's one way, is you just twist the Scripture to make it embrace your New Age nonsense, or you make it back up your socialist nonsense or whatever. Okay, that's one way. Uh, The second way that this is done is when someone abuses the text of Scripture in such a way as to represent a truth that is orthodox enough, but the text concerned has nothing to do with that truth. The first kind of deceitful handling twists the text to unedifying conclusions, while the second kind of thing twists the text to an edifying conclusion. But it's a deceitful handling in either case, and Paul rejects that kind of thing. Not Uh, handling the Word of God deceitfully. Abusing the text to make it say something true is abusing the text nonetheless. C.S. Lewis once commented on the preachers of another era, and he said that if the text had had smallpox, the sermon wouldn't have caught it. So let's not be like that. So, continuing on with episode 203 in the podcast, uh, my book review this time is a book called Conscience by Andy Nacelli and Crowley, a gent named Crowley. Conscience by Nacelli and Crowley. Now, uh, this was a, when I saw this book, I stumbled across it. And when I saw a biblical treatment, and when I saw it was by Nacelli also, who's a good, good exegete, a good, good writer. I picked it up, snapped it up right away. And the reason uh, I did is because I, as a preacher, I have had this nagging sense for many years that I needed to preach a series of sermons on conscience. The Bible, uh, it's the New Testament that provides us with sort of the, I, I, I don't want to say the invention of conscience. It's not the invention, but the first exhaustive teaching of what conscience is and what can go wrong with it. Uh, comes to us in the in the New Testament. So, and there are the the New Testament just assumes a number of things about that word conscience, and yet there are a remark is it's a remarkable variation. So someone can have, for example, a strong conscience. Someone can have a weak conscience. Someone can have a defiled conscience. Someone can have a seared conscience. So what is it to have a seared conscience? What is it to have 
guilt on your conscience? What is it to have a robust conscience? So, uh, and, and this book doesn't disappoint. It goes through every text in the New Testament that refers to the conscience and unpacks it and, and arranges these uh, passages and the teaching of these passages in a good order and then works through it using, using the examples that, that were in play in the first century church, but also using examples that are in play uh, in, our, in our time, in our day. So, you know, for example, the weaker, the weaker brother eats only vegetables, as Paul t- says in Romans. And Paul says that we're to receive one another, but not, but not for the sake of disputing about doubtful things. And Paul shows his hand. Uh, so he says the weaker brother eats only vegetables. But if the stronger brother takes that verse that says the weaker brother eats only vegetables, and he beats the weaker brother over the head with it, uh, he is, uh, <laughs> the weaker brother is not paying attention to the verse. But in that case, neither is the stronger brother paying attention to that verse, because neither one of them are obeying it. Uh, Paul says, defer to one another, make room for one another, accommodate one another. Another thing that comes out in this book is that it's possible for a man to sin by doing something that God does not say is a sin. So, if, um, if God says it's perfectly all right to, to drink wine, for example, which he does, there's nothing wrong with drinking wine. According to the scriptures, there's, 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 it's not malum in se. It's not an evil in itself. But let's say someone was brought, brought up in a strict teetotaling home, and they believed heart and soul that drinking alcohol was a sin. And let's say with that frame of mind, they went and drank some because they wanted to sin. <laughs> well, congratulations, they did. They didn't sin against the law of God, but they sinned against their conscience. They sin- now their conscience ought to grow stronger. They ought to they ought to grow up in their in their conscience. They ought to they ought to make their conscience stronger. And uh, this book helpfully gives instruction on how to do that and how not to wound your conscience while you're making it stronger. Let's say you're in the position of a weaker brother. Uh, th- this is something that you you know intellectually you could do and not be violating the law of God, but because of your upbringing or because of some bad experience in the past, you've got a conscience issue with it. You can't just flip a switch and make your conscience okay. You've got to do certain things to prepare yourself to grow your conscience, which is very different than insulting your conscience. At any rate, this is an accessible book. It treats of an important subject. It is a very important subject. It is the kind of thing that I think uh, every every pastor ought to have a copy of this book, and uh, and I would encourage you to use its use it as a helpful resource as you prepare to teach your people about the importance of conscience. If you enjoyed this episode, check out more audio from Doug on the Canon app.